Uh, okay, can everybody see this? Fine. I don't need to turn the lights off or anything. Okay, so uh, I'm really excited about what we're going to do today and actually for the rest of the semester. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what I want you to sort of see in today's work, which is, and also uh, talk about how that's going to relate to what we're doing for the rest of the semester. So, so far this semester you've done a lot, all the kind of heavy lifting of learning philosophy, right? Like you've learned a lot of theories, you've learned how to make arguments, you've learned how to interpret other people's arguments. Uh, so now what we want to do is take all that, you know, muscle, brain muscle that you've developed and flex it on some interesting problems, right? Uh, that, are, that don't involve trolleys or prisoners and boats. And so uh, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to try to look at <coughs> issues in our lives that are related to technology and digital life. That's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. Today, we're going to start with something that's called the Uncanny Valley. It was actually a um, theory by a Japanese roboticist. His name is Masahiro Mori. So, we're going to look at uh, Masahiro Mori's theory, the Uncanny Valley, the Johnson Addendum, named after yours truly, and uh, the problem of distinguishing uh, like from is. So the basic question we're going to start with is, how much like a human do you have to be to be a human? Understand the question? Well, so what's the answer? How much like a human do you have to be to be a human? 100%. 53%? Okay, yeah. It's a weird answer. Yes. No, that is not a dumb question. That is a like, philosophically astute question. What is a human, right? So if I'm asking you, is this like a phone or is this a phone? You're going to have to know what a phone is, right, before you can answer. All right, let's, let's uh, go forward and see how if we can make that question even more complicated. All right, so this uh, adorable man is Masahiri, Masahiri Mori. I know, right? Oh, uh, he, uh, he was a roboticist, um, and he developed. It. How many people have heard the phrase the Uncanny Valley before? Never. Okay, you're gonna be, you're gonna learn what it is in a second. So, uh, in 1970, he wrote this essay proposing a, what he called the theory of the Uncanny Valley. And I want to just start off with his exact, his exact words. So the basic hypothesis of his essay was this, that as a robot is made more human-like in its appearance and motion, the emotional response from a human being to the robot will become increasingly positive and empathetic until a point is reached beyond which the response becomes quickly that strong revulsion. However, as the appearance and uh, emotion continue to become less distinguishable from a human being, the emotional response becomes positive once more and approaches human-to-human -human empathy levels. So that's his exact words, but because I've, uh, that's a lot to swallow, uh, if you've never heard of it before, here's a quick explanation. Two and a half minutes. We've all come face to face with the uncanny valley. You might have been watching a movie, playing a video game, or watching the colorful animatronics at Disney World. You had that gut feeling that something just wasn't quite right. In 1970, Japanese robotics engineer Masahiro Mori first coined the term Uncanny Valley. Mori noticed that the more human his robots appeared, the more people reacted positively towards them. However, when the robots appeared very close to humans, but not enough to be convincing, people found them to be visually revolting. This chasm between nearly human and fully human is what Mori identified as the Uncanny Valley. With the advent of CGI technology, discussion about the Uncanny Valley has been more prevalent than ever, as filmmakers and animators alike have continued to struggle with it for decades. One of the most prominent examples is the film Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. The film featured more realistic CGI animation than had ever been attempted. The main character, Aki Ross, was composed of over 400,000 rendered polygons and 60,000 fully rendered and animated hairs. Despite this meticulous attention to detail, the film bombed. The failure of Final Fantasy has been largely attributed to the Uncanny Valley, which was a major source of criticism from filmgoers and critics alike. That same year, DreamWorks Animation Studios narrowly avoided the Uncanny Valley themselves. During a test screening for the film Shrek, 
Children started crying because the main character, Princess Fiona, had been rendered too realistically, giving her a spooky effect. As a result, the animators of the film toned down the character's realism and made her features more cartoony. But Fear of the Uncanny Valley has not stopped filmmakers and animators from continuing to try and innovate realistic CG animation. The Polar Express, a film released in 2004, pioneered new motion capture technology. This process involved recording the movements of live actors for their animated counterparts. The filmmakers hoped that this new technique would remove the unnatural movement of digital characters that made audiences uncomfortable. This technology was received with mixed success. Technology may someday reach a point where the uncanny valley is no longer a problem. Robots and animation could become so sophisticated that they blend in seamlessly with reality. One thing is certain, technology will never stop trying to push the limits of realism. The uncanny valley is here to stay. Okay, so uh, just to sort of recap, this is Maury's chart of the Uncanny Valley that he included in his original essay by the same title. And what it does is it uh, charts out on this x-axis uh, the, the increasing human likeness of a robot. So as a robot begins to look and move more and more and more like a real human being, we move further down this axis. And then this y-axis marks the human emotional or affective response to the robot, okay? So what he, and you know, the dotted line is, is uh, uh, tracking uh, moving objects and the, the solid line is tracking still objects. Okay, so what we see is that the more and more a, a robot begins to look and move like a human being, the greater and greater we like it, but only up to a certain point, after which, what happens? It's to look creepy. Yeah, it starts to look creepy, right? And so uh, our, our affective response to it changes to negative, changes from positive to negative, and we, we experience what uh, Maury calls the uncanny. I'm gonna say more about why he's using that word later. But this is the uncanny valley. Right, like, so this is the experience after the kind of peak of liking it, right, and before you get back to uh, liking, uh, before you get back to liking a real human being. Okay, so just to make this a little bit clearer, uh, you know, if we take a robot that's just like a basic functional robot, we don't have we don't have any feelings one way or the other about it, right? We don't have strong positive or negative feelings. But if you make that robot just slightly more human-like, if you give it legs. Like this is R2D2. Uh, if you give it legs, if you make it where its head can turn and it makes booping noises that sound like language, right? Then we like it a little more. Make it even more human, right? Give it an actual human-like body. Give it a face with eyes. Give it hands, right? And we like it even more. But there comes a point, right, where it gets too human-like. This was the problem with. Did everybody see the Polar Express? I know you were probably like eight, all right? So. This was really the problem with the Polar Express is that many, many, many people uh, like had a hard time with that movie because it was too creepy. It was too uncanny. Um, then you know it only gets more human-like after that. This is one of the uh, more recent robots from the Geminoid Project, which is a humanoid robot project in Japan right now. And then of course, like the creepiest thing in the world to me. Is the Burger King? <laughs> <laughs> but like, why is Burger King? Why is Burger King King so creepy? Because he's too human-like, right? He's just a little like if he was more cartoony, he wouldn't be creepy, right? If, if, but he's just a little too human-like. Okay, so uh, when Maury originally wrote this essay about the Uncanny Valley, he was mostly thinking about uh, uh, Barack and puppets, right? Which is a Sort of, I'm just going to show you a very brief clip of this, but I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can see very clearly, but there are actually people dressed in entirely black uniforms that are controlling the puppets. Can you see? Uh, but, they, but the puppets are actually quite human-like, right? They have uh, quite human-like emotions. So that's what uh, uh, Maury was thinking about when he first wrote the essay. And, you know, actual robotics development was not that human-like um, in 1970. However, today, uh, uh, robots are extremely human-like. So I'm gonna show you one of uh, the robots from the Geminoid Project. 
So this is Gemini BK, a robot. So the Gemini project is a humanoid robot project in Japan where they create Geminoids. Anybody in here in Gemini? What is a Gemini? A twin. A twin, right? Like so, right, so they're creating human-like robots. Every new Geminoid robot is, you know, gets a letter. So there was Geminoid A, then there was Geminoid B, then there was Geminoid C. So this is Geminoid DK, so like a variation on Geminoid D. This is in 2011. The, the new Geminoids are incredibly realistic, right? So, uh, anybody, anybody find this creepy? On you. <laughs> yes? Why? Because there's something off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's just look at one more, one more little thing from Je from DK. This is an afternoon where they put DK in a in a bookstore, put a cup of coffee and a book in front of him, and uh, most of the people thought that he was a guy, a real human being. What's he doing now? Well, he wasn't doing that. Like, because like you can tell, there's like no emotion in him that yeah. like, it's possible. Okay, well, we're, let's, let's see what, what this is really about. Okay, so the word uncanny actually comes from Sigmund Freud, right? Uh, father of psychoanalysis. Um, the word in German is das Unheimlich, right? Uh, and Freud says one of the things that we have to realize about uh, the Unheimlich, right, the uncanny, is that it's a bizarre sort of experience. So Unheimlich literally means like, homely, familiar, you know, comfortable. And so what's happening in the experience of the uncanny or the, the unheimlich is that you're actually having simultaneously an experience of something that is both familiar and unfamiliar, right? So simultaneously, you're having the experience of familiarity and strangeness, right? So you are both attracted to and repulsed by the same object at the same time. That's a very unique cognitive and emotional experience, right? Imagine if you walked into a perfect replica of your bedroom. I mean, perfect replica of your bedroom, right? Would that, wouldn't that be a weird experience? Yes? Right. Why? Because it's, it's literally like the most familiar thing to you. It's your bedroom, right? But because you know it isn't really your bedroom, then you have this uncanny experience. This is both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. It's that, that's what gives us the like creepy feeling, okay? Um, so I've been researching and uh, reading and exploring about this issue for about the last seven or eight years now. And one of the things, uh, when I very first started working on the Uncanny Valley, that kept bothering me and bothering me and bothering me was this question. Why is it a valley and not a precipice, right? You know what I mean by a precipice? Like, why is it the case that there's, a, there's an upward curve, right? And it doesn't just drop off forever, you know? Like, so we would say, you know, the closer and closer and closer uh, a robot looks like a real human being, the more we like it, up until a certain point at which it becomes creepy, and then it just keeps getting creepier and creepier and creepier. Right? Like, what explains this? Like, why, why does it, what, is the, what explains the line back up? That doesn't seem to make any sense. And, oh, do you have a... I mean, eventually, aren't you not going to know whether it's a human or not? That's a really good point. So he said... Eventually, aren't you going to be able to not know whether it's a human or not? So let's say there's a robot that's, you know, robots get more and more and more and more and more like humans. They simulate humans closer and closer and closer until finally there's a perfect replica, right? Would you have the experience of an uncanny, the experience of the uncanny if you were, had a, a perfect simulation? Maybe if you But if you knew, it wouldn't be a perfect simulation, right? Well, like right now, you guys don't find me creepy. But if the real me walked in right now, <laughs> right, and was like, ha ha, that's the robot me, then suddenly you would all find me really creepy, right? But if I'm, but you know, if I am a perfect replication of myself, right? You're not having the experience of the uncanny, 
You're having the experience of the real me, even if in fact I am not the real me, and the real me is out in the hallway waiting to come in for the big show at the end of this. Oh, that might be happening. <laughs> Keep your seatbelt on. All right, so so that's an excellent question, but this is the, so this is what we've got to figure out. Like why? Like what explains the curve back up, right? So. I, I actually uh, came up with what uh, I call the addendum, Johnson addendum, to or addition, right, to Maury's theory of the uncanny valley. And my my explanation is that uh, Maury is missing basically another y-axis in his original chart. Now, in my defense, let me say this: in Maury's or, original essay, the uncanny valley, he says. I haven't figured this all out yet. I need somebody to complete the Uncanny Valley. That's how the essay ends, right? So I'm not just like stepping on somebody's business by, by jumping in and changing his chart. He knew that more, like more sort of thinking had to be done about this. So my suggestion is that we have to make a distinction that would bisect basically the bottom of the valley. Because on the one hand, as you just very rightly pointed out, if we went all the way to the bottom of the valley, what we would find at the bottom is not a zombie, but the most human, I mean, the most human-like robot possible, an almost perfect simulation, right? That would be the, that would be the creepiest thing ever. Something that looked almost exactly like me, but, or something that did look exactly like me, but the real me was standing there too, right? So you knew that like, it's an almost perfect simulation. That would be on this side. But what would be on this side, the side that goes back up to a healthy person? Well, I think that's where the corpse belongs, right? So on this side, at the bottom of the valley, the worst experience is an almost perfect simulation, which is the most human-like robot that's not really human, right? And on the other side, you have a corpse, which is something that is really human, but is the least human-like. Right? It doesn't move, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't talk, it doesn't do anything that the humans do, but it is an actual human. Okay? So the distinction that we're making is, on the one hand, the distinction between non-humans and humans, and also between simulations, like the apparent and the real. Okay. Now, so how do we explain the negative feelings on the downward slope of the valley? Well, we, we say, look, we're, our brains work in such a way that we are averse to being deceived, right? Why do I find uh, robots creepier and creepier and creepier the closer they approach human likeness? Because at some point, I'm worried about mistaking the simulation for the reality, right? I'm worried about mistaking the, ro the, the robot me from the real me. A tremendous amount of social scientific and, and uh, co you know, cog scientists, right, neuroscientists, doing, psychologists doing a lot of work in the last 10 years, and all the studies basically reproduce exactly the same thing that Maury said. They're like, yep, this is how human beings react to human-like robots. So it seems to be, I mean, I hate to use the word, like the language of hardwired in our brain, but it does seem to be like, uh, Hardwired in our brain. <laughs> yeah. Does this start to like clones? Like if you were to say that you were the clone of Dr. J and then Dr. J walks in and says, yeah. ha this is my clone. I would think you were really weird because like yeah. you don't have a mom and dad and you were made in the test. Does that ever Yeah, but is that any different really than a robot? I mean you're talking about like a ver like a replica of me, a simulation of me that has been produced by technology, right? So it doesn't really matter if it's clone which, you know, biologically, I mean, we'd have to have, that would, this would be a whole other conversation for another day, whether or not clones are humans, right? Uh, but <coughs> biologically, it would not, you know, it would be different than me, but, but simulate me almost perfectly. And I think you would have, yeah, I think you would have the uncanny experience. Yes. Then, like, identical twins, we don't get freaked out because we know that they're human? Actually, identical twins are kind of freaky. Really? Are they not? I think it's cool. Yes, they are. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, is that, you know, I mean, you know, there's a long history of literature and poetry, right, that says, like, you know, like, has anybody ever seen, like, The Shining, like, yeah. the twin? Yeah, that, you yeah. Know, right? It's like, it's easy to use twins for pee okay. Uh Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that, 
I mean, I'm not trying to say all twins are creepy, right? But I do think that to the extent that, let's say that you were friends with identical twins, right? And they yeah. switched up on you. You would have that. You would have that sense of of the uncanny, right? Like if you thought that you were talking to one, but you really weren't sure, you know, because of this, because your you are your brain is averse to being deceived, right? You don't want to mistake a simulation for the real thing. Yeah. I was gonna say like, what about the whole thing of robot? You kind of have that feeling of that person doesn't have a soul. Well, I mean that's an interesting. Yeah. You see I mean, yeah. and that's kind of uncanny. So, like, how do you expect if it's a robot and they're always uncanny, does it look like they have a soul or not? Well, I think that, okay, so two, two separate things. One is I don't think that we want to say anything that's creepy is also uncanny. Because uncanny is a very special kind of creepy, right? It's this experience like of co like cognitive dissonance where you're experiencing both familiarity and unfamiliarity at the same time. Like, I may see something that creeps me out because it's totally unfamiliar to me. Like, if I saw, like, a tarantula. I mean, I know what a tarantula looks like from books, but, like, if I saw a tarantula, like, I would be like, oh, my God, that's, like, a completely creepy novel experience for me, right? Uh, but that's not, that's not an uncanny experience. So, so, yeah, we have to, so uncanny is a very special kind of creepy. But the same thing about the soul, I think, is interesting. I mean, I think that there is, you know, if like if the replica of me walked in, or if the real me walked in, depending on whether or not I'm the replica, uh, right now, you would presume that one of them is a real me and one of them is a manufactured or a simulated me, right? And that it's the real me that has a soul, and the other one is, you know, all like springs and bolts on the inside or something like that, right? So, I I do think that that maybe the fact that you see something that looks like a human, but that you know doesn't have a soul, which is an essential part of what it means to be a human, might contribute to that familiar, unfamiliar, uncanny experience. I could see that happening. Okay, quickly, because we got a lot more to do. Yes? Okay, well, we'll come back to you, okay? So we explained the downward slope uh, by way of an aversion to the deception. We explained the upward slope as our aversion to you know, death, to morbidity and mortality. So just to look back at, you know, my, my, you know, addendum to the chart. So why is it that after, at a certain point, we start to, you know, fall off into negative affective responses to robots? Because we're afraid of mistaking the simulation for the real. Uh, why is it that uh, we find corpses and, you know, mangled and disfigured human beings creepier than healthy bodies? Because we're averse to death, right? And mor morbidity and mortality. Okay. Why should you care? This is the question you should always ask yourself. Stop for a moment, ask yourself, why should I care? <laughs> Very good. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you why. Uh, okay, so just last week, right, when we were doing Charles Mills and the Metaphysics of Race essay, we saw Mills point out that the difference between appearing and being when it comes to race is sometimes really hard to determine, right? So remember the, uh, you know, Mr. Oreo who goes to the Skylar machine and, and becomes white, and then the question is, is he really white or is he just, does he just appear to be white? And if he just appears to be white, how is that different than really white people who also appear to be white, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, one of the things that we kind of opened up in Charles Mills was like this difference between uh, appearing and being, or seeming and being. Uh, but it also goes for lots of other things, gender, sexuality, religion, culture. So uh, what we need to ask is like, how actually do we define the difference between the like, the seems to be, and the is, the really is? Um, it seems to be a clear distinction to make when we're talking about the differences between humans and non-humans, although I don't think it's actually that clear. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. All right, so let's look at race. You probably know who this is. So this is a short time-lapse video of Michael Jackson's change in appearance over the course of his life. <coughs> Okay, so 
One thing I want to say first, and we will get back to this later, but I did not make this video. I got this off of YouTube. So I did not write, if this is going on on the outside, what's happening on the inside? <laughs> I did not write that. However, I do think that we should think about why would somebody ask that, right? Uh, why would somebody say, I mean, you know, the guy's just changed his appearance. Why would we think that because his appearance has been changing, Right, if there's something you know going on on the inside. But you said my own hair used to really creep me out yeah. when I was a kid. How many other people had that experience at some point? Like had that sort of yeah, you're you're creeping <coughs> out, right? Uh, I think for a lot of people, this had to do with the fact that you know he was pa passing or seemed to be trying to pass as white, although he always never said that that's what he was trying to do. But a lot of people sort of thought, yeah, you you see you appear like a white person, but I know you're not a white person, right? And so there's this you know weird sort of uncanny experience with him, almost entirely revolving around race. Okay, so I want to say that this also interestingly applies to gender. So we're going to look really quick at. Uh, a short video of um, uh, several people who identify as transgender or uh, non-binary, gender non-conforming, and who uh, were asked, they were, they were given one word, passing, and they were asked to like give their uh, response to the, to the word. So, I'm going to watch this. This is the one that makes me look like a boy. When I get dressed in the morning and if I choose to do the work to pass today, I wear this hat. Mix. Half of me wants to be completely passing and just have no questions asked. I can get about my day. Um, the other part of me just wants to be able to be myself and get respect for who I am. Subjective. I know before transitioning, I wasn't what you would call passing, but it just always felt like this unobtainable goal that I was trying to reach, and once I did reach it, it just seemed really insignificant. Degrading. I don't want to pass. I want to be seen for who I am. Survival. It meant that you could walk safely down the street, you could go to and from work, you could have a job. Cis. I think passing is about appearing cis, and I think it allows people to have part of that cis privilege. Unfortunate. So I pass as a man. I don't identify as a man. I identify as non-binary, but I pass as a man. For people who are transgender men and who identify strongly as men, they're not passing as men, they just are men. And the idea that they are passing is not as men, but as cisgender. That. Okay, so what the, our last speaker here is saying is that uh, this is, you know, you guys out there are making a mistake when you say I'm passing as a man, that I'm appearing to be a man, right? I actually really am a man, and that this whole like uh, 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 emphasis on appearance uh, is misunderstanding, right? Now, let's just be honest. Uh, a lot of people in our world are not comfortable with upsetting gender roles, right? And so this is why you hear people say, you know, get freaked out when they can't tell what it is, right? And, uh, and say horrible things like, what is it, right? Now, when you go and see, oh, what's the, the what's the, what are the movies where Tyler Perry dresses up like a... Medea. Yes, Medea movies, okay. So when you go and see Tyler Perry dress up like Medea on the big screen, right, you are effectively going to a drag show, right? Like you've gone, you've gone to see a guy dress in drag, a guy dress up like a woman. Nobody feels threatened or bothered or, oh my God, what is he about that, right? Right? Nobody does. Uh, 
Uh, and presumably, you, if you actually do go to drag shows, you don't feel that way at the drag show either. Like when somebody's on stage or they're on screen, right? You know, you're not bothered by it. But you know, uh, theorists, you know, one of the theorists that were not, unfortunately, not going to this semester, Judith Butler, once said, "Why are we not bothered by drag on stage or on the screen, but we are bothered by drag sitting on the bus next to me?" Right? Or behind me in the line in Kroger. Why is that why is that bothersome? It's just pretend up there. Like if I see like the Terminator, I'm scared. Like I'm Yeah. 
So I guess, I guess it's harder for me to think that way about race. Like when people are like, I'm really black on the inside, but I was born white. Yeah, which means that she, on the, on the, she holds what metaphysical position about race? Huh? No. <laughs> no, that was like a, that was like a million percent wrong. Yes, she's a racial realist, right? Like she's still trying to act like race is biological, right? Essential. Okay. No offense, most people are racial realists. Uh, they just don't admit it. Uh, so, you know, we make moral judgments about passing, etc., um, as if these people are lying. Um, there's also political questions. These came up in the Black No More uh, scenario that we talked about last week. Um, so why is it that the people who, uh, the, in George Schuyler's novel, the black people who go through the, the whitening machine to become white people, why aren't they really white people? Why are they only people who appear to be white, right? Um, well, the reason, the only reason that question even makes any difference is because it upsets, because their passing or their changing upsets the, you know, the basic architecture of a racist social and political order, right? I mean, it would make no difference. Racial passing would make no difference. Racial identities would make no difference if we didn't live in a fundamentally racist social order. Okay, so all of these sorts of ap apparent differences, right? Uh, are kind of hinting at much of the same thing that Morty was talking about when he was talking about the Uncanny Valley. They give us this feeling of familiarity and unfamiliarity that is unsettling in a, both a cognitive way, like a thinking way, and an emotional feeling way, right? So what, who, what of these sort of uh, uh, technological changes in appearance, right? Or do we find most disturbing? So this is Michael Jackson, or you can put Rachel Dole's all there, right? Uh, my, my, my boy DK. <laughs> and Caitlyn Jenner. Does everyone know who Caitlyn Jenner is? She's only the most famous transgender person ever in all of history. Right? Uh, okay. So who, who says, of these three, I find Michael Jackson the most disturbing? Okay. Uh, how many people say DK? Okay, how many people say Rachel? I mean, uh, uh, Caitlyn Jenner. That's weird, that's like close to a third, third, third. Uh, slightly less for Caitlyn, um, which is actually kind of surprising. But there is this, this is, this is what we're gonna be talking about uh, between now and over the course of the next week, but especially on Friday, is uh, we have to sort of figure out as robots become more and more human-like, sort of what are we holding on to, right, as unique about humanity, right? That's, that allows us to say, no, we're real humans and they're just like humans, right? The truth is that you interact with human-like robots probably every day, right? Like you are, uh, I mean, I guarantee you don't bank with a bank teller, right? You bank with your phone or with an ATM machine or like some other human-like robot, right? Uh, you probably, t as the last per customer service person you talk, talk to is probably a robot. Uh, you know, if you, if you take an online, if you're taking an online class this semester, you're basically dealing with a human-like robot. If you've ever been catfished, you've been human-like robot, isn't it, right? Um, so, I know, ooh, that, that, that touched a nerve was you all. Look at that, some people got catfished in here. Good. Uh, okay, so we have to we have to actually talk a little bit more about that. Let me get to you in just one second. But I don't know if you guys are watching this. This literally was happening this morning and at lunch today, so I couldn't even put it in the PowerPoint. But today, you know, uh, Microsoft released a, a Twitter bot right last oh week called Tay, <laughs> called Tay, who like within seventy two hours became like a white hot raging racist, you know. <laughs> because she was learning how to act like a human from Twitter, right? And, you know, and pe you know, people were, you know, like basically sort of like, it's like garbage in, garbage out, right? Well, the crazy thing, so of course, you know, she started like uh, posting things about Hitler and white supremacists and yeah, the Holocaust didn't happen and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and so, 
you know, Microsoft had to delete a bunch of her tweets and take her down uh, to, you know, correct her or whatever. Well, all of a sudden, this morning, this very day, this morning, she reappears on Twitter for like two and a half hours. Her first tweet is just sitting here smoking, smoking a blunt in front of the cops. So she clearly has not learned her lesson, right? Because uh, she's got this, she's got this sort of, they, they programmed her to have the personality of like a young teenage girl. And so, so anyway, so she's, so she's adopted this sort of thing. So she shows it back up on Twitter today for like, for like 30 minutes, you know, three hours or whatever, and is, you know, already just as awful as she was, you know, uh, before. But here's the thing, Microsoft can't explain how she showed it back up on Twitter. See, this is the beginning. Uh, <laughs> I hear you. What? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's a million movies. There's a million movies about computers becoming self-aware, right? Yeah. I'm just saying it actually happened today. No, no I'm just kidding. It did not happen. Uh, but what but what I'm saying is, like, we, it, like, VK, not the guy you need to worry about, right? Uh, Twitter bot Tay, worry about, right? That's who we got to worry about, right? So we're going to talk about that uh, primarily in relation to um, questions of uh, personal identity, right? And so here's your assignment for Friday. Uh, you're going to watch the very short film, uh, Be Right Back. It's less than an hour long. It's 47 minutes long, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's 47 minutes long. It's already on your blog, so you can go there and you can watch it there, or th there's a link if you want to watch it on YouTube. Um, and it deals with exactly this question: uh, how how much can uh, how close to you can a robot reproduction of you be before they actually are you, right? Um, so you're gonna watch it. Now, uh, this is a warning, please pay attention, I need everybody's eyes here. There is adult language and adult content, so do not watch this around your children, you know, your children or your little brothers and sisters or your boss or your mom probably. Uh, there, there is language in it. I mean, obviously there's language in it, but like there's bad language in it. Uh, and, I, and it does have like, I think one very brief sex scene. Uh, but like you need, to, but uh, it's also very disturbing. So there's that too. So like, uh, make sure you watch that before Friday. Um, what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to write before Friday, not before Friday, but before Friday at midnight. Uh, you're gonna need to write, a, you know, a short essay on either the stuff we talked about today with the Ogani Valley about the film Be Right Back, which you're gonna watch, or about if you want something in the real world like. Twitter bot Tay, uh, who that relates to, you know, the Uncanny Valley or the issues that are raised and be right back. Okay, so you have a really broad, broad, broad scope of things that you could possibly write about. Okay, don't pack your stuff up. I'm gonna take questions now, but while while I'm doing that, I'm gonna show you like my other favorite uh, Uncanny humanoid robots. I'm just gonna let this play behind me, so. Okay, these are, yes, okay, yes. I think it's catfishing. Oh, so uh, catfishing is a phenomenon that sort of uh, arose on Facebook that where someone uh, pretends to be, uh, like sets up a profile um, and gets into a, a di an entirely digital relationship with another person. Uh, and the idea being that um, the, the person has, is the person, one of those people is not actually IRL in real life, right? The same as their profile. Okay, so that's catfishing. It, it was named catfishing because of the documentary, the 2010 documentary Catfish, um, which is now an MTV series. Um, but actually, two weeks from now, we're going to be talking about catfishing. So, uh, so like, if so, yeah, you know, some of y'all need to bring tissues. You should. <laughs> Hey, I'm just telling you, I know, I know flesh and blood human beings that don't dance that well, so, yes. Is the catfishing thing off the uh, creepy lady on Facebook? Yeah, that's, that was the first, uh, yeah, that's the first instance of it. But, I mean, if anybody who sees, I mean, you really should uh, check out an episode or two of the MTV series because it, it, it like, it, it's happening all the time, yeah. And unfortunately now, because older and older people are getting on Facebook, it's happening to you know, more and more global people, so. Other questions, yes? What are we talking about, catfishing? 
We're talking about catfishing in two weeks. Okay. Uh, so this week is be right back. Uh, next week we'll have a, a different set of tech, tech issues, tech problems. Um, and yeah, and then the following week is the catfishing. Also on Friday, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to send around his paper. Uh, you're going to need to give me the names in each of your groups. We're going to draw cards, see who goes first, um, just so we can get those dates set for the end of the semester. All right, last thing I want to say, announcement, tonight at 7 p.m. in Spain Auditorium, the Black Student Union is hosting a panel called Know Your Rights, which is going to address, among other things, like what to do if you run in, have, have a run in with a policeman. Uh, so you're invited to come to that. It starts at 7. I think it should last about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I, I, you have no chance of getting arrested. Just kidding. <coughs> All right, uh, all right, I'll see you on Friday. Read more, write more, think more. Read more. All right, see you there.